Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody, for coming to hear Noam at this very critical juncture. Um, it's an honor, of course, to introduce Noam Chomsky. It's actually a very easy job, because I don't have to say anything. <laughs> no, and especially to this crowd in the People's Republic of Cambridge. <laughs> and, uh, but I should just say to do due diligence that Professor Chomsky is Professor Emeritus of Linguistics at MIT and also holds this prestigious position of the Institute Professor. But more than that, he is, suffice to say, is often described as America's greatest public intellectual. So welcome, Noam. Uh, tonight, uh, I understand uh, 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 Noam is going to talk about what he has titled the talk is after the electoral extravaganza. Well, it's continuing and the show is going to go on, so it'd be great to hear Noam on this. Well, in my opinion, this is a historical uh, campaign season, uh, not for the reasons that you'd hear from the mainstream media, but for the reason of the tremendous mobilization of people that we have seen. A working people, maybe they're not going in the right direction all the time, but regardless, this is a mobilization that we haven't seen uh, since, I would say, and I wasn't here in 1968, but the convention in Chicago, I, I, um, it, it brings me back to those days because somebody, I think it was uh, uh, Mayor, uh, or is it uh, Rendell, who's the governor of Pennsylvania, just comment, uh, made a comment saying that better watch out these uh, delegates from uh, Bernie, better, better fall in line. So it just reminded me of the situation in Chicago, but the situation is now is, 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 is different. Uh, um, but what I think is happening, and as uh, uh, Professor Chomsky will definitely talk about it, the issues that he talks about are not in the in the mainstream media, which are also not the real issues that people face. And some of these are uh, the issues that uh, Mass Peace Action is working very closely. One of them is the people's budget. We have a budget in the United States. I come originally from the defense industry. I'm a whistleblower before arriving at MIT. And the defense budget is a $600 billion budget that makes these weapons, makes profits for the companies, and, and makes our foreign policy so much dependent on the militarism that we have seen. But we have also, we can take some credit, and Mass Peace, and Peace Action was very much involved to move the policy against another war, for instance, against Iran. So we now have an Iran deal, and we have a lot of work in front of us, because a lot of people are, are sabotaging that uh, continuously uh, today. Uh, we are also involved in fighting wars in general and stopping further uh, um, military actions in, in, in Syria to m give diplomacy uh, a chance. So, and, and Professor Chomsky in our last uh, uh, um, uh, get together at MIT talked about the connection of this military spending and climate change. So all of these are not talked about. Even Bernie Sanders is not talking too much about the military budget that we have to attack that to solve our problems. So thank you very much for coming. Without much further ado, <laughs> Professor Chomsky. Uh, well, I'll uh, pick up from Subretta's last comments. Uh, uh, we're all familiar with the uh, Sherlock Holmes story about the dog who didn't bark. And we're now experiencing a remarkable and uh, revealing example of that uh, curious phenomenon, namely the electoral campaign in the most powerful country in world history, uh, the leader of the so-called free world. Uh, as I'm sure you know, since 1947, the uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has, uh, uh, take, has displayed a, a doomsday clock where the hands are a certain distance from midnight. Midnight means termination. Uh, the hands move up and back depending on world circumstances. 
uh, last year, they were moved uh, two minutes closer to midnight, uh, three minutes from midnight, closest it's been since a major war scare in the early 1980s, stayed there this year. And they explained uh, that there are two reasons for that. Uh, one reason is the growing threat of nuclear war, which means terminal war, and the other, of course, is environmental catastrophe. Well, anyone with eyes open must be aware of the severity of threats to these, to survival, literally. Just to give a few illustrations, uh, right now at the Russian border, uh, the US-run NATO alliance is rapidly building up its uh, offensive forces, in fact, planning to quadruple them, it's a huge increase. Russians are reacting in kind. Uh, here's the way the confrontation is described in, in the press. It happens to be the New York Times a couple of days ago. So I'll quote, by, sharp, by sharply ramping up so-called intercepts of American ships and planes in Central and Eastern Europe, Russia is demonstrating its anger over the increased American military presence in a region it considers part of its backyard, White House officials said. They call the Russian actions harassment. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, another way of looking at it is that it's not on the Mexican border, it's on the Russian border, the traditional invasion route through which Russia has been virtually destroyed several times in the past century, many times before. In fact, if it had come anywhere near the Mexican border, we wouldn't be around to talk about it. We have had would have had a nuclear war a long time ago. Uh, the background to the uh, Russian harassment on the Russian border, as the State Department sees it, is uh, the very rapid NATO expansion that took place uh, as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed back 25 years ago. Uh, the, there were alternative visions of a future system presented. Uh, one presented by Gorbachev, uh, representing the Russian views, was that there would be a, a general a Eurasian security system, all both military blocs would disappear. Uh, there would be centers in uh, Brussels, uh, Moscow, uh, Ankara, Vladivostok, in a joint uh, global security system in peace and amity. Now, that was rejected by the West uh, in favor of uh, maintaining, not only maintaining NATO, but rapidly expanding it. Uh, it's kind of interesting that that passed without comment. F since NATO's origin, the justification for it had been very simple. It's necessary to protect the Western Europe from the aggressive Russian hordes. No more Russian hordes. So what happens to NATO? It expands. Uh, first under Bush number one to East Germany, then under Clinton, right to the Russian borders, then on. Uh, in the last few years, uh, there have been invitations from NATO, 2008, 2013, invitations to Ukraine, which is right at the geopolitical heartland of any uh, Russian uh, strategic analyst, and of course, long historical and cultural ties, invitations to join NATO as well. Well, the threat that this would pose was understood right away, right at the very beginning. Uh, George Kennan, uh, other senior statesmen, uh, described this as a tragic mistake, a policy error of historic proportions, uh, now leading to the point of major conflict, very likely major conflict. If you read the arms control journals, uh, they warn that both sides are acting as if a war is thinkable. They're laying plans for war, and they're preparing for it. And anyone who's paid any attention to the shocking record of the last 
70 years should be aware that it's literally a miracle that we survived. I mean, the record of near uh, termination is just outlandish. Uh, new cases keep being discovered. A couple of months ago, it was revealed that uh, in 1979, under Carter, uh, the U.S. automated response systems, uh, which make hundreds of errors, the Russian ones undoubtedly are even worse, uh, the automated response systems, which are supposed to detect an incoming missile attack, uh, did detect a Russian missile attack. And in, Protocol is it goes up to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they approve a response, goes to the National Security Advisor, then speaking of Brzezinski, he calls the President, he launches the missiles, and we say goodbye to each other. Because it's well known, by now it's been for years, that a, a first strike by a major nuclear power is going to essentially be terminal, uh, just from the effects of nuclear winter alone. Uh, Brzezinski was on the phone calling Carter to launch a strike when the information came in that it was just one of the many hundreds of false alarms. There's been case after case like that. That's quite apart from highly adventurous actions by the political leaders, which they knew might lead to nuclear war, but proceeded anyway. The cases are pretty amazing. Uh, the threat of serious nuclear war is understood by leading figures. Uh, one of them who's been outspoken recently is uh, William Perry, who was former defense secretary, a conservative nuclear specialist on nuclear affairs, taken quite seriously. He's warned uh, repeatedly that the threat of nuclear war today is greater than it was even during the Reagan years. And that's pretty plausible. In fact, the, just the fact that a nuclear war is even considered thinkable is really an astonishing commentary on human imbecility. Again, the first, a first strike, the attacker would be destroyed. There's no question about that. Uh, and to regard to be planning for something like this is you can't find words to describe it, but it's happening. And something similar is happening in the China Seas, uh, where US, uh, there are very serious US provocations, uh, military vessels going within what the Chinese regard as territorial waters, comparable to what we would describe. Uh, recently, a nuclear-capable B-52, by accident, flew over a China, uh, an island that the Chinese claim. Uh, these things, it's, it's less threatening in uh, uh, Asia because China doesn't have much of a retaliatory capacity, but they're going to develop it. And if the provocations go on, they'll develop it and we'll be in deeper trouble. And as you know, I'm sure the uh, Obama administration is planning a huge uh, uh, what's called improvement in the nuclear posture, a trillion dollar expenditures to build up much more lethal and threatening nu nuclear weapons, including uh, we uh, s small weapons with a small yield, which are particularly dangerous because there'll be a temptation to use them. And all you have to do is use one and it escalates out of sight. Well, that's uh, that's brief look at uh, what's happening in the world of nuclear weapons, uh, what's happening in the primaries. Uh, the dog is completely silent, no barking. Uh, nobody on any side is saying a word about it, except for strident calls repeated today uh, from the Republican establishment to build up the nuclear weapons system and the whole military even beyond its extraordinary proportions today. We didn't get reports from the Ryan-Trump meetings, but you could be pretty sure that uh, among the things they agreed on was that. That's one of the points they have in common. Uh, that's kind of an interesting proposal if you look at it, both Trump and Ryan. Ryan is more dangerous than Trump in my opinion because he's taken seriously. But if you look at the proposals, 
the actual numbers. Uh, the call is let's increase the military budget, let's sharply reduce taxes, particularly on the rich, uh, no other sources of revenue. The military budget is already over 50% of discretionary spending. They just do the arithmetic. There's nothing left. Any part of the government that might be of any benefit to the population disappears. That's just arithmetic. Of course, there's all kind of mythology about how there's going to be amazing growth and so on, but we can forget that. Uh, that's quite apart from the consequences of building up the military budget, like uh, quadrupling the NATO stance in, on the Russian border and another trillion dollar expansion of the nuclear program. Well, the doomsday clock partially, one of, its cons one of the reasons the minute hand is moving closer to midnight is that. The other one is environment. Uh, there the threats are no less severe. And the silence of the dog is equally dramatic. Uh, almost nothing being said about it, a few words here and there. And it's very uh, serious. I don't have to stress that for you. This is the first time in human history ever, 200,000 years of the history of the species, when we have to ask the question, are we going to uh, uh, take steps to guarantee at least extend the possibility of decent survival, not in the distant future for our children and grandchildren. That's the question. And of course, we've already answered that question for innumerable other species. The uh, level of species uh, extinction because of global warming is at the level of the so-called fifth extinction 65 million years ago uh, when uh, an asteroid hit the Earth, huge asteroid, that caused a catastrophe, uh, ended the uh, age of the dinosaurs, uh, opened the way for the rise of mammals, ultimately us, and we're now paying our respects by becoming the asteroid. Uh, the level of uh, species destruction is back to that level, and we're next. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, I mean, every issue of a science journal gives more chilling prospects. I'll just read a couple, but you can find them every time you open a new science journal. There's a new study in Nature Geosciences found that the pace of environmental change now is faster than at any previous time in the world's history, uh, maybe at least a hundred times, maybe a thousand times as fast. Uh, you've probably seen the report by James Hansen, 18 co-authors. Uh, they studied the last time that the world warmed uh, naturally. That's about 120,000 years ago. Pretty similar temperatures. Uh, much of the polar ice disintegrated, and uh, they've established that the sea level rose about 20 to 30 feet. Uh, that's where we are now, but that was over a long period. Uh, this is immediate, much more rapidly. They estimate that the worst case could be maybe 50 years, uh, followed by increases so precipitous, I'm quoting now, that they would force humanity to be a hasty retreat from the coasts, loss of all coastal cities. Now, the real catastrophe would be soon in places like Bangladesh, a coastal plain where billions of people are without sustenance or opportunities for survival. Uh, the, uh, uh, virtually all the land ice on the planet has already started to melt much more rapidly than was expected. And the melting of the Arctic ice, which is taking place quite rapidly, it will also release uh, vast amounts of methane into the atmosphere that's uh, in, short, in the short term much more lethal than CO2 that drives the crisis onward. Just the last example, another study investigated a period that's called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum 60 million years ago. 
uh, there was at that time a natural CO2 release, drove st strong warming that caused, I'm quoting, amplifying feedbacks, dwarfing of large animals, ecosystem disruptions, soil degradation, water cycle shifts, other major changes. And again, that was over a much longer time, likely to be more severe. That one affected the Earth for more than 100,000 years, and today would be utterly catastrophic. Uh, another threat, very much alive right now, is drought. It's happening all over. Uh, a couple days ago, the press reported that uh, in India, quote, much of India is reeling from a heat wave and severe drought conditions that have decimated crops, killed livestock, and left at least 330 million Indians without enough water for their daily needs. Uh, that's now. Just think what happens when the Himalayan glaciers have melted, eliminating the water supply for South Asia. I mean, if anybody thinks there's a refugee crisis now, in fact, there isn't. But if you believe that, imagine what happens when this goes on. Well, what's the dog doing? Nothing. Uh, the Democrats, you get a couple of polite comments, very little that's serious. In the case of the Republicans, there's not much talk, but there's some, and the few remarks are pretty serious. Every single Republican candidate denies that it's happening, with a single exception. Kasich, who says, yeah, it's happening, but we shouldn't do anything about it. So we have, he's the smart guy that everybody praises. So that's 100% agreement on the part of the political party that controls Congress that either it's not happening or we don't do anything about it, we should not regulate emissions. So in short, let's race to the precipice as quickly as we can. Uh, I should say that the dog is not only silent in the primaries. Uh, you may have seen a report that Greenpeace released a couple of days ago. They somehow got hold of uh, 280 pages from the latest so-called tri trade agreement, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, an investor rights agreement masquerading as free trade. The provisions have a very harsh effect on climate. And they point out that in these 280 pages, the phrase climate change does not appear, doesn't matter. Take a look at the business press, same story. A lot of talk in the last couple of days about the plans of Saudi Arabia to reshape their economy, They're the biggest oil producer, front page of the New York Times, you know, Financial Times, and so on. A lot of discussion of the possible consequences. So will it cause oil prices to rise, which could harm American consumers who are worried about whether they can drive enough this summer? One problem. Or will it cause oil prices to drop, which has the negative effect of driving American shale producers out of the market? Uh, most highly polluting uh, fossil fuel extraction there is outside of tar sands. Something's missing. Not a word about the effect on the climate. Uh, that's, and it's well understood that unless almost all the fossil fuels are left in the ground, we're pretty much doomed, but the dog is silent. That's very common when uh, fossil fuels are discussed at all. Uh, so if you happen to take a look at today's New York Times, the business section, the lead article is about uh, the huge forest fires in Canada and Alberta. The forest fires are the probably the effect of global warming, and they're accelerating it for the obvious reason they're destroying a major carbon sink. And the article, what the article is worried about, though, is something different. The forest fires are slowing down temporarily extraction of tar sands oil, the absolute worst kind. And they're concerned, is this going to harm the Canadian economy? There's good news. Uh, pouring resources in to make sure that the tar sands are lifted as, oil is lifted as quickly as possible, so maybe it won't be too bad a problem. A dog is silent, not a word about the climate change effect. 
uh, well, what are we doing about it? In 2009, the uh, nations of the world agreed uh, to uh, limit planetary warming to two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level. Uh, that's, we've already reached about half that amount. Uh, 2015, last December, uh, there was a major con international conference in Paris. Uh, it aimed at reaching a treaty uh, that would establish limits on carbon emission. Uh, the limits were much too high, but at least it would have been something. But they couldn't do it, and they couldn't do it for a very simple reason. It's called the Republican Congress, which would not permit a treaty. So therefore, it's a voluntary agreement, which means nothing happens. Uh, a couple of weeks after that, the Republicans in the Supreme Court uh, barred very mild restrictions that had been proposed on uh, carbon emission. Uh, the, uh, 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 it's a message to the world that says, we're not gonna do anything, so you don't do anything either. And again, every Republican, including Kasich, says, don't do anything about it. Either it's not happening, or if it is happening, who cares? Uh, eliminate the EPA, stop regulation, let's race to the precipice. That's what we want to do. That's quite an amazing comment on the human species, if you think about it. It's, uh, it's the, this is the one species in history that has achieved what we call higher intelligence, and this is the way it's being used. Uh, there, in fact, it would not be an exaggeration to say that the, and this should be headlines in every newspaper, that the, today's Republican organization is the most dangerous organization in human history, literally, for this reason alone, and there's others. That's what the headlines should be reading, and the Democrats are not that different. Well, there is a bright side. The bright side is that much of the population is well ahead of the political leadership. Uh, there is a very strong case that uh, without a carbon tax, uh, the situation is almost hopeless. And uh, at least according to some polls, that's, uh, there's some pretty remarkable results. One recent poll found that almost half of uh, the population in the United States does support a carbon tax, which is pretty remarkable since articulate support is very low mostly opposition, if it's mentioned at all, and uh, elite opposition to it is just overwhelming. Uh, no less remarkable is the fact that uh, a majority in every state supports regulation of CO2. Uh, that's true even in the so-called red states. And it's alleged that in every congressional district, a majority favors requiring utilities to use clean energies. Uh, those are hopeful prospects that can be built on. And there is substantial popular activism worldwide. Uh, the question of whether it will prevail is the most important question that has ever arisen in the history of the human species. And it's going to be answered by people like you and pretty soon. Thanks. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, what do you feel is the most important action the people can take to turn back these destructive forces? Voting is not it. What else do you recommend? Voting should take, uh, is imp it's worth doing. I mean, to keep the, uh, basically for one reason, to make sure that the Republicans don't get into office because the danger that they pose cannot be overestimated. It should take about five minutes of our time to think about it, and another 10 minutes to do it, and then you go back to the serious work, uh, which is what ought to be going on all the time, uh, working to take these 
uh, popular attitudes, as long as people just, that I mentioned, when people just think them, doesn't matter very much. If they're organized, mobilized, energized to do something about it, uh, whether it's uh, lobbying in Congress or demonstrations or uh, uh, civil disobedience or whatever it might be, then it means something. Now, that's the way every positive change in history has taken place. So fine, you know, vote, it's okay. But meanwhile, go ahead and do what's important. Uh, thank you, Professor Chomsky, for your wonderful presentation. So, channels of communication, I think, are becoming very, very important, in, like channels of communication like mass media, electronic media, social media. And uh, what would you uh, re uh, like envision? How is it going to develop? A lot of the times people now talk about scientification of journalism or scientification of media, m meaning that they bring like hard evidence and numbers and data and scientific study results to prove the point. So would you think that if media and education institutions get together, they will voice, um, their voice will be heard better by politicians and you were talking about the psychological catastrophes and dooming day. So how would you envision the future role of media and science getting together in this direction? Well, first of all, I mean, on, the, on both the environmental crisis and uh, the nuclear issues, the, uh, the science and the professional journals and associations are pretty straight, but they don't reach many people. They reach a small sector of uh, educated opinion, and that has to reach the public, and it's not gonna reach the public through the media. Uh, what I described is pretty typical. Uh, they're not gonna reach the public through the electoral process. Again, what I described is pretty typical. The dog doesn't bark. So how does it reach the public? Through people like you. Um, what's been found over the years and what is indeed uh, shown in uh, careful studies is that the most important mode of organization is face-to-face -face contact. I mean, that actually shows even uh, in political campaigns. Uh, there was an interesting study recently by uh, Andrew Coburn, very good military analyst, uh, journalist, uh, appeared in The Atlantic, I think, in which he reviewed a series of studies comp uh, uh, a deter uh, deter uh, kind of analyzing how political spending uh, influences elections. Turns out that the impact is pretty slight. That people don't pay much attention to television ads. But what has an enormous effect is canvassing, going door, door to door and talking to people. That turns out to have a huge impact. Incidentally, this doesn't mean that the political spending is wasted by the people who are spending it, because remember that they're not just trying to get their candidate in, they are buying something very precious called access. If you fund a political candidate, that candidate's doors are open to your lobbyists and corporate lawyers who can go in and write the legislation that the candidate ultimately will sign half time without reading it. Now, that's the way the legislative process works. And it also does have an impact on, uh, on, on the electoral process. But what really has a major impact is talking to people. And that means local organization expanding to national and international organization. And we know that from history. Just take a look at the major uh, achievements of, say, even the past generation. So the civil rights movement, uh, women's rights, uh, uh, opposition to nuclear weapons, environmental concerns, it all developed this way, and that goes way back to abolitionism and uh, you know, overthrowing the feudal system as far back as you can go. So that's what has to be done. And uh, it's really a job for every, everyone, wherever you happen to be, whatever opportunities you have. 
Um, Professor Chomsky, um, first, um, I'd like to thank you very much for, um, for your time. And um, uh, before I um, give my uh, question, I'd just like to um, uh, say thank you, um, especially for your uh, documentary released on um, American foreign policy on Netflix, because um, uh, that's what inspired me to um, uh, pursue a career in politics and also um, become uh, quite a huge fan of you since my uh, freshman year. I'm now well, a junior. A small correct. They're not my documentaries. The, the documentaries are the people who do them. I'm kind of like the moon in a documentary about the moon. Okay. You know? <laughs> I don't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and they deserve the credit. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And um, also, uh, forgive me, this question might call for um, a bit of speculation, but um, you have, um, I'm sure everyone in this room knows you've described yourself um, as an anarchist in the past, and we're all aware of um, how you define anarchism. It's very um, sensible and logical, but um, in You've um, highlighted a lot of um, problems that we face, not only, you know, like as a country, but as a human species. And um, in an anarchist society, um, how could a lot of these um, problems be solved in probably maybe a more superior manner, too? Well, that depends on uh, your faith in human beings. So, for example, if decisions are in the hands of an informed public, which has, which participates in structures of cooperation and mutual aid, uh, are you likely to have more uh, humanly uh, benign consequences than if they're made by a group of corporate lobbyists, uh, state uh, state bureaucrats, and so uh, uh, dictators, and so on? It's a guess, but I think it's a pretty safe guess. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for speaking with us this evening. It was really a pleasure to hear you talk. Yep, no worries. Um, so you mentioned that the military budget is increasing and that I'm not sure if that's your speculation that it's increasing for nuclear weaponry or if that's some... Well, to get know. the facts straight, yeah. it's now about 53% of discretionary spending. Okay. Okay. The uh, Obama administration has called for a rapid increase, trillion dollars, over the next couple of decades in uh, uh, modernizing and developing the nuclear component. Mm -hmm. uh, I think just about every, every re Republican candidate, certainly Trump and Ryan, the two major ones, have called for substantial increases in the military budget. They don't give numbers, but okay. substantial. Okay, so given that, um, how would you characterize Obama's planned visit to Hiroshima? his visit to Hiroshima. Well, it's about 70 years too late. Right, but, I mean, uh, aside from <laughs> and, aside from and depends, well, you know, depends how it's handled. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this was a, a real watershed in human history. I mean, the Hiroshima bombing told everyone who was listening that we're, from now on, we're Fate, we are facing destruction. I remember it very well. I won't talk about it personally, but uh, it was a shattering uh, a disclosure. In fact, the atomic scientists themselves really hadn't thought about it very much, turns out. They knew that there was a possibility that it could instantaneously destroy life on Earth if it happened to set off reactions that would expand. But uh, and it was pretty horrible the way it was. And remember, that was a very small bomb by contemporary standards. And it's quite interesting to look at the developments since that time. This goes back to your question about elites and the population. So uh, there is a kind of a standard history of a scholarly history of uh, the nuclear weapon system by McGeorge Bundy, former Harvard Dean, who was national security advisor for Kennedy and Johnson, you know, kind of liberal side of the spectrum. And he was given access to uh, highest level documents and so on. And, and the book's interesting reading, but I think the most interesting part, again, is the part where the dog doesn't bark. Uh, there's one paragraph in the book, around the middle, uh, which I don't think historians have ever even commented on which is just mind-boggling. Uh, he, here's what he says. He says, around 1950, 
the US, of course, had overwhelming uh, power, just way ahead of the Russians, technologically far ahead of everyone else, uh, unbelievable security. Uh, but there was one potential threat to the United States at that point, potential. Uh, ICBMs, international, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, with advanced uh, hydrogen bomb warheads. They didn't exist, but in the course of time, they would exist. And he points out that he was un unable to find any comment, even a staff paper by someone, suggesting maybe we should try to stop it. And maybe we should try to enter into a treaty with the Russians to ban the development of the only weapons that could wipe us out immediately. Apparently nobody cared. Uh, was it a possibility? Very likely. The Russians, as I said, were way behind. Uh, even Stalin at the time was making significant gestures uh, calling for some kind of negotiations and settlement. In fact, one crucial offer remember it pretty well, in March 1952, uh, was an offer from the Russians to uh, permit Germany to be unified. Germany's, of course, an incredible threat to Russia. Just take a look at the history. This is right after the Second World War. Permit Germany to be unified, allow democratic elections internationally supervised, which the communists are sure to lose, and the West will win on one condition, that Germany not join a hostile military alliance. It was pretty interesting what happened. Uh, the information was withheld for a while so that Truman could put through a huge increase in the military budget. It was finally released, but kind of dismissed with, as kind of a joke, you know, who can take that seriously? And anyone who mentioned it was just ridiculed. Well, now the Russian archives have come out. And it turns out it was pretty serious. And the mainstream historians, including very anti-communist ones like Adam Ulam at Harvard, agree that it could have been serious. And there were other such possibilities. But they were simply dismissed and disparaged in the interests of building up a massive military system to intimidate the world and pursue our interests. And the, the idea that we might do something to protect the people of the United States from destruction doesn't seem to have arisen, literally. And if you look over the history, that happens time after time. Uh, that's the kind of decisions that are made by uh, political and economic elites. Uh, so for, you know, it's, it's kind of comparable to when uh, ExxonMobil uh, decides to suppress the information that they have from their own scientists uh, that if we continue what we're doing, we're going to destroy the human species. But let's keep quiet about it because it's more important to make profit tomorrow. Uh, those are the kinds of decisions that you find all through modern history and in fact, you know, going way back. Uh, and uh, these are the core issues that just have to be overcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Chomsky, much like everybody else said, thank you very much for your time and for, for your, sharing your knowledge with us. I was just curious what your opinion was, given the fact that international treaties, for the most part, are kept um, you know, unfulfilled. And those that are fulfilled are generally binding agreements, such as the TPPA, that are negotiated in private. And their effect to the environment is highly detrimental. But because of their secretive nature, we as the quote unquote elected, uh, the electorate don't have access to them and don't have input. What can we do so that we can voice the concerns that these international agreements that would bind us um, pose to our day-to-day -day lives? Well, first of all, we can demand access. Now, that's the kind of work that's being done by major criminals, some of the leading criminals in the world uh, that the US government is dedicating enormous resources to trying to capture and silence are people like uh, Julian Assange and Edward Snowden who are breaking the rules seriously. The rules are exactly what you said. 
power has to be protected from scrutiny. Because if people know what the powerful are doing, they're not going to like it. So therefore, it has to be kept secret. Uh, former uh, professor of the science of government at Harvard, Samuel Huntington, noted liberal analyst and scholar, once said that, I uh, forget his exact words, he put it rather nicely, that uh, power uh, must be kept in the shadow if exposed to the sunlight it begins to evaporate. And he even gave an example. He said, uh, uh, th since the Truman Doctrine throughout the Cold War, uh, we had to, the US government had to pretend that it was the Soviet Union that we were fighting uh, whenever we intervened anywhere, because otherwise you wouldn't get popular support for it. If you say you're intervening to prevent uh, democracy and freedom and uh, human rights, uh, people aren't going to rally to it. But if you tell them the Russians are coming, yeah, then they will. And rather strikingly, it's pretty striking what I mentioned before, uh, what happened to NATO. That was only one of a number of crucial things that happened right at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's kind of interesting that the, uh, the media, the educational system, scholarship, kind of ignore it. But if you want to understand what the Cold War was about, the best place to look clearly is what happened when it ended. Okay? Russians are gone. For 50 years, everything was done because the Russians are coming. Okay, no Russians. What happens? We expand NATO. Uh, there were uh, the Bush administration, Bush won at the time, uh, of course, came out with a new national security strategy. Uh, said pretty much everything will go on as before, but with new pretexts. So we still have to have a huge military system, and not to defend ourselves against the Russians, they're not there, but because of, I'm quoting, the technological sophistication of third world powers. That's why we have to have this huge military system. Uh, they said we have to maintain what they called the defense industrial base. That's a euphemism for the high-tech economy, uh, which is funded by the taxpayer in what's called a market system, in which taxpayers pay the costs of research and development and innovation over long periods. And if anything comes out decades later, it's handed over to private enterprise for marketing and profit, and computers, internet, the satellites, so we have to maintain the defense industrial base. Actually, one of the most interesting comments was about the Middle East. It said, we have to maintain intervention forces directed at the Middle East. This is 1990, and you know what happened since. Why? It said, in the, we have to, uh, aimed at the Middle East, then came this interesting phrase, where the uh, serious problems we faced could not have been laid at the Kremlin's door. In other words, we've been lying to you for 50 years. It wasn't the Russians. It was what's called radical nationalism, independent nationalism. Had to follow Huntington's advice and pretend it was the Russians. But in fact, the problems couldn't be laid at the Kremlin's door. Uh, it goes on like that. Uh, NATO was not only expanded to the east, its mission was changed, officially, to be a global mission, uh, what they call defending, meaning controlling the international energy system, pipelines and sea lanes. All of this tells you an awful lot about foreign affairs. Did you study it in school? Did you read it in the media? Do you find it in scholarly journals? I mean, it's there. Same on the uh, trade agreements. Uh, what Greenpeace just released basically tells us what any rational person knew. These are investor rights agreements. They have almost nothing to do with trade, nothing at all to do with free trade, uh, enormous protectionist measures, protection of investor rights. Uh, and of course, they have to be negotiated in secret. You know, can't tell people that. Uh, but you see, when people say they're negotiated in secret, it's a little misleading. They're not secret to the corporate lobbyists and lawyers 
who are writing the legislation. They're the ones writing the details to make sure it comes out correctly for their interests. So they know about it, and their corporate masters know about it, and of course, government bureaucrats know about it. It's just you're not supposed to know about it. And then uh, it's supposed to be passed by a system that's called fast track. And every reasonable person is supposed to be in favor of fast track. What's fast track? Stalinist style legislation. The government gives, you, gives Congress a choice, yes or no. No discussion, no debate, which of course means yes. That's the height of democracy. Well, do we have to accept that? And it's across the board, uh, case after case. Don't have to accept it. And notice that the people who tried to break it, like Snowden, Assange, Manning, they are some of the leading criminals in the world. Huge resources are devoted to trying to capture them, if you can, to get rid of them, sequester them somehow. I don't know if, how much the extent to which this is done is kind of shocking. Like uh, Snowden finally made it to Russia. And uh, a couple of years ago, the, uh, he would like to go to Latin America where he could get uh, asylum. Uh, the uh, Bolivian president, Evo Morales, uh, flew to Russia for just negotiations of some kind. And uh, as he flew back to Bolivia, the European countries, under threat from the United States, of course, would not permit the plane to cross their airspace, which is pretty shocking. The plane was finally forced down in Austria, and it was immediately invaded by Austrian police to see if this arch criminal was trying to escape. I mean, that's the, and Assange is, I think it's now four years, has been locked up in a room, basically. I visit him there. It's actually worse than being in prison. Can't even go outside, you know. Uh, but, but these people cannot be permitted to survive. They're much too dangerous because they're trying to lift the veil to help people know what's going on. And that's really dangerous. And if you, uh, anyone who's spent time going through uh, ar archives, you know, declassified documents, you very quickly discover that almost nothing has anything to do with national security in any serious sense. It's mostly security of power against the domestic public, the primary enemy. And it is an enemy, because if they know what's going on, they're not going to allow it, which tells us what we ought to be doing. Get people to know what's going on. It's, it's possible. Thank you. So, um, as everyone else said, I just wanted to say thanks for speaking. Um, I guess my question is a little more abstract in the sense that um, it's more about the cognitive dissonance that many of my generation feel surrounding what we're told about climate change versus how we're told to live our lives in the sense that we're still encouraged to uh, have children, we're still encouraged to continue consuming in unsustainable ways, um, uh, pursue careers in spite of the fact that we're also taught in the same institutions that are encouraging us to go on, have careers, live our lives. Um, that uh, sort of catastrophic climate change at this point is almost inevitable. Um, so I guess my question is, do you have any advice for dealing with that intense cognitive dissonance and not be paralyzed by uh, the sense that there's nothing we can do and uh, our generation is basically doomed to inherit an intractable problem we're only, your generation is only doomed if it decides to be doomed. There's plenty that can be done. It's by no means a foregone conclusion. Now, there have been much harder problems in human history, even recently, that have been overcome. Uh, you can name any number of them. I mean, take, say, one of the real achievements of the past generation, women's rights. Uh, back in the 1950s, it's not that it looked impossible. Uh, the question doesn't, wasn't, a ra wasn't raised. It happened. Uh, take uh, 
anti-Semitism at Harvard, which people like to talk about. It was real at one point. When I was a student in 1950, it was very real. There was almost no Jewish faculty, two or three people. In fact, one of the reasons MIT became a great university is because people like Norbert Wiener, superb mathematician, couldn't get jobs at Harvard, so they went to the engineering school down the street. You know. uh, that's the kind of thing that's happened throughout human history. Uh, late 19th century, Irish were basically treated like African Americans, which is the absolute lowest you can get. Uh, you could read signs in Boston restaurants saying no dogs are Irish. Years later, they took over a large part of the political system. You get presidents and so on. There are things that can be done, always. And there are things that can be done about this. And it, was, it would have been easy, all, you know, say for abolitionists, I mean, that was a horrifying struggle. They could have easily given up, but some of them didn't, and finally worked. And the same is true now, except now it happens to be more urgent even than any of those cases, because it is a question of survival. So there's no reason not to go on with your life, every reason to continue, in fact. That's where you get the sources of sustenance and strength to do the political work that you need. So that makes good sense, but there's, we have a lot of opportunities. We have a legacy that has been won by our predecessors. We can start from a higher platform. A lot of things have been won already. We don't fight about them anymore gives it a chance to go on. Hi, Professor Chomsky. My name is Ibrahim. I'm a student at Boston University. I just had uh, two questions. Um, my first is, do you have any advice on how we can make our businesses as well as urban development sustainable and socially responsible? And then my second question is, what can we do as educators as well as college students to encourage youth empowerment and civic engagement? Well, um, if you take the second question, if you look over the record, very characteristically, uh, students have been in the forefront of the kinds of political engagement that led to serious change. It was true of the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the uh, anti-war movement, and goes way back. And there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason is that students are at a period of their life when they have maximal freedom. They're sort of mostly out of parental control. They're not yet in the circumstances where they have to dedicate themselves to putting food on the table. Uh, they have opportunities to think, uh, to interact with one another, uh, to undertake actions, and many have done it. And that can lead to change. As for sustainable businesses, yeah, create them. There's plenty of things that can be done. There are plenty of very important things, like uh, worker-managed uh, enterprises, uh, enterprises that are uh, dedicated to uh, uh, avoidance of destructive forms of energy, like fossil fuels, and uh, develop uh, uh, sustainable energy, huge opportunities there. And there's case after case. Thank you. Hello, Professor Chomsky. The, um, so in the conversation about uh, climate change, we hear a lot about the issues, some of which you spoke on tonight, related to trade and oil industry and transportation. But some, one of the issues that I find is omitted often in the conversation is the in, unsustainable ways in which we produce our food and the meat industry uh, ac across most developed countries. And I'm aware that the United Nations has, I think in the past year or two, released statements encouraging most societies to move toward a vegan diet and vegetarian. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, industrial uh, food production is a major contribute, contributor to CO2 emissions. And uh, not just meat production for one thing, but also uh, foods in general with 
massive use of pesticides and fertilizers, uh, highly energy intensive. And uh, this whole system really has to be radically revised. Now, that's another serious form of activism, which can be done very locally. I mean, the so-called localist movement, you know, farmers markets, uh, local production, uh, that's a step towards it. But it has to be done on a massive scale if there's going to be survival. The food problems and the water problems are massive. Thank you so much for speaking with us um, this evening. Um, I'm graduating um, for, with my undergraduate degree um, later on this week, and I have noticed within my peers a severe lack of critical thinking. And I'm wondering if you have any advice to give to the next generation of scholars um, and what kind of advice you would give them to continue um, to continue the fields that you do work in. What advice to younger scholars and nothing but the simple virtues? You know, be question dogma. If things are, uh, are accepted without question, if they're generally accepted doctrines, you should immediately be suspicious. And nothing is that clear. And you should have an open mind, critical mind, be willing to challenge, uh, stay honest, uh, be willing to face criticism and threats. And there can be threats, don't want to deny it. An attempt to be independent, an independent thinker can uh, bring upon himself or herself a pretty serious threat. It is a very free country, so you're not going to be sent to a torture chamber but it might undermine chances of getting the kind of job you want. Okay, those are the kinds of things that you face in life. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I've been seeing more and more reports, even now in mainstream media, about the 28 redacted pages in the 9-11 Commission report. And many people are now claiming that the information in those pages implicates um, Saudi official involvement and in possibly funding the hijackers for, for the attacks on September 11th. If those claims were ever able to be verified and that information was actually released to the American public, uh, what effects do you think that would have on U.S.-Saudi relations? I mean, the 28 pages certainly ought to be released. Right. But I suspect what they're probably going to reveal is just the total incompetence of the intelligence agencies and the political leadership who had plenty of evidence that something like this was likely to happen, but just didn't pay attention to it because they were interested in something else. Mm -hmm. The chances that it will implicate the government in 9-11, I think, are minuscule. I mean, if just think it through. If the Bush administration had been involved in any way and was in a position to kind of shape the perception of what happened, what would they have done? They would have blamed the Iraqis. They wouldn't have blamed Saudis. Their main goal at the time was to invade Iraq, not Saudi Arabia. That's their ally, you have to protect them. In fact, the fact that Saudis were implicated was a big embarrassment. Uh, the Bush administration had to break its own laws and fly its rich Saudi friends out of the country when there was supposed to be you know, air control. Uh, they, were tr they wanted desperately to invade Iraq. If they had blamed the Iraqis, uh, they would have had overwhelming support for the invasion. They wouldn't have had to invent stories about uh, weapons of mass destruction, which discredited them when they exploded. Uh, even crazier stories about uh, connections between Saddam and Al-Qaeda. They wouldn't have had to resort to torture, most of which was uh, directed by Rumsfeld and Cheney to try to get some piece of information that would link Iraq to 9-11. And we know what the effects, quite apart from the moral and other dimensions, what the effects of the exposures of torture were. I mean, unless they're totally insane, they couldn't have been involved. 
So I don't think the 28 pages which should be opened are going to reveal that. I suspect what they'll reveal is the usual incompetence and lack of concern for extremely serious uh, threats. I mentioned a much more serious one, the lack of concern to try to block uh, ICBMs with nuclear war with hydrogen bomb warheads. Now, that's mind-boggling. The one, unfortunately, no, you know, fortunately for power, nobody talks about it. But that's the kind of thing I would expect to be exposed. But it should be released. We should find out. So there should be pressure. Thank you. Hi, Professor Chomsky. Well, <laughs> my voice is a bit gone. Uh, I just came yesterday, 24 hours ago, from for the first time to the USA. I come from Argentina, Spain, and I came from Reykjavik. It was a tricky situation uh, because Reykjavik and Iceland in this moment are going on, ongoing on a very, very complicated financial, financial situation, a very big crisis. I am an educator, I teach languages. I have been teaching in Iceland how to teach the students, the younger students, how to use their own language because it's very difficult. And I was, very, every time I've been traveling since the Panama Papers happened, since I hold an Argentinian passport and a Spanish passport, uh, I've been very stressed to be a minority. So I have, I, I've been listening to all, to, to you. I didn't know you were going to be here, so it was a big surprise for me. And I would like to address two questions to you. The first one is, in your opinion, what builds a nation, since everybody has been talking a lot about na nation defense, nationality defense, uh, the defense of the community. And secondly, I, after, I didn't yes. catch what is yes. the question. The, the, after that one, what, the question would be, what do you think it builds those uh, components, the, those words, nation, community? And after that question, I asked myself, would you agree to the fact that educators, but not only well-educated people in the, legal, like in the legal system of the levels, are the best defense for a community to avoid this uh, secrecy and conspiracy, paranoid threats that we're constantly advertising in the media? It's a well, big On the complete. second question, yeah. the people who are privileged and most well-educated people are privileged, <laughs> academics are particularly privileged, but to the extent that you have any privilege, you have responsibility. Uh, privilege, like if you're spending 50 hours a week trying to put food on the table. Uh, there's a limited number of things you can do. If you're privileged the way most of us are, there's a lot you can do. So there's more responsibility. Uh, it doesn't mean it's going to be used well. In fact, quite typically, if you look at the record, it's used to support power, but it doesn't have to be. That's a choice. But if you're educated, yes. If you're privileged in other ways, yes. You have the responsibility to do things. I mean, as far as... Uh, national groups and cultural groups and so on, they, you know, it's kind of, depends on what you make of them. It makes perfect sense for people to uh, find uh, communities in which they're comfortable, in which they share values, in which they share ceremonies, uh, traditions, and so on. All of that's very healthy, uh, and a healthy society should encourage it, as long as it doesn't turn into attacks on others. That's the difference. If it's a matter of uh, cooperation with others, it enriches the society. If it's a matter of uh, trying to crush others, then it harms the society. But these are all our choices. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, Noam. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for your years of service to people without power, um, to uh, knowledge and reason on behalf of people without power for the most part. Um, two days ago, the Obama administration awarded Henry Kissinger uh, an award. It was conferred by Ashton Carter from over here at the Kennedy School. His friends call him Ash. Um, 
at the Pentagon. The award is uh, the Distinguished Public Service Award. It's the highest award that can be given to a private citizen, I guess, by the Pentagon. I'd be interested to hear you talk a little bit about your assessment of Henry Kissinger. And in, <laughs> in particular, I'm, 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 I'm especially interested to ask because of what I take to be an explicit endorsement of voting for Hillary Clinton if it should come to that, given the closeness um, of, of the Clintons to Henry Kissinger and the kind of the role that that kind of politics in international relations has played in, in the Clinton administration could be expected to play in a future Clinton administration. Mm. Again, mm. what's your take on Henry Kissinger? Well, Kissinger's made some intelligent and useful comments. Uh, one of them was, I uh, can't remember the exact words, but he essentially tried to define what the responsibility of uh, an academic serious intellectual is. And he said it's their responsibility to uh, formulate accurately and appropriately the interests and the wishes of the people in power. In other words, you should be a toady. You should sit at the feet of the powerful and try to help them achieve what they're trying to achieve. And if you look at his own record, say in the 1960s, he was desperately trying to uh, become the advisor to either side. Uh, you know, Nixon, Humphrey, whoever would accept him and put him in a position of authority that carrying out this responsibility. And he had plenty of initiative, and it wasn't pretty. Uh, we can run through the cases you're familiar with, and most people are. But uh, you can see why he would get an award at the Kennedy School. He was performing the duty of a responsible intellectual, uh, implementing the wishes, intentions, and goals of the powerful in an effective way. What's wrong with that? That's the way you... You know, that's the way it progress in the uh, educational institutions. Well, the award was at the Pentagon, but um, maybe there's not much difference. But um, there's a difference. Pentagon a little tends to be more open usually. But what about what about what about the relationship between um, Clinton, Clinton and, and Kissinger? I think Clinton, if I recall, is already on record as saying that Kissinger is one of the admire her admired statesmen. So sure. If it won't be Kissinger, it'll be somebody comparable. He happened to be pretty good at it, but there are others in the wings. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Chomsky, for coming out here tonight. And um, after hearing like the brutal facts of the environment and um, the potential of nuclear fallout, I think a lot of people like myself and a lot of people in the crowd might feel like a general like a like helplessness or even hopelessness of like a possible. Um, of escaping the inevitable extinction of the human species. So I want to know, um, how would you recommend overcoming that sort of like maybe nihilism or pessimism? So yeah, that's my. Well, let's go back to Kissinger. Uh, he is one of uh, a few senior respected statesmen, George Schultz, uh, uh, Nye, a couple of others, who are calling for elimination of nuclear weapons for good reasons, your reasons. And there is a legal obligation, legal obligation to pursue for the nuclear states, uh, to pursue what are called good faith measures to eliminate nuclear weapons. That's, that's in the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 6, and it's also, there's a World Court decision in uh, 1996, which basically, uh, repeated it as a legal document. So we're pr on pretty strong ground if we uh, call for the elimination of nuclear weapons. And uh, it can take, it can go in stages. Like one stage can be what, say, William Perry has recently proposed, elimination of ICBMs, one of the parts of the triad, and a particularly dangerous part. Uh, these are almost useless. And they're guarded. Guarding the ICBMs is one of the lowest level 
uh, tasks that people in the military can be assigned to. So half the time they're drunk or you know playing poker or something like that, which means that they could just go off by accident. And they're doing almost nothing in, in terms of defense. They're kind of like a power symbol. So eliminating ICBMs would be a pretty straightforward move. Uh, another straightforward move would be, and this is quite significant, uh, to try to establish nuclear weapons-free zones in various parts of the world. That's a move towards, first of all, has an educational effect of bringing people to see, look, we can do something, but it also does reduce the threat of conflict. There are several. There's one in the Western Hemisphere, but not including everyone, not including the United States and Canada, includes everyone else. Uh, there's one in the in for Africa, but not entirely, because the U.S. insists on maintaining a major nuclear base on the island of Diego Garcia, from which the population was helpfully expelled by the British, so the U.S. could build it up, and Obama's built it up even further. Uh, so it can't quite uh, implement it in Africa. Uh, there's one for the Pacific. But again, there's a problem. At first it was blocked by France, which was carrying out nuclear tests there. They stopped. But now the US insists that the uh, Pacific Islands that the US controls be used both for storage of nuclear weapons and passes, passage of uh, nuclear submarines and so on. So that one can't be implemented. Uh, the most important one uh, is, the, is a, Middle East, uh, a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. Uh, that's extremely important. Uh, for one thing, the future of the non-proliferation treaty depends on it. This is not widely advertised, but if you take a look at, say, arms control journals, the non-proliferation treaty is the most important military treaty we've ever had. It's restricted, it hasn't limited, but it's restricted the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, that treaty is contingent on steps to take to establish a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. The, that has been, the initiative comes from the Middle East states. The Arab states and Iran have pressed very hard for a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. Recently, it's mainly Iran. Uh, Iran ha was the head of the non-aligned movement, and which strongly supports this and uh, in that position has dramatically and repeatedly called for moving to establish a nuclear weapons free zone in the region. But if you look back at the negotiations, literally the future of the non-proliferation treaty is contingent on doing that. Why has the whole world, practically the whole world in favor of it, can't go through. You know why? Because people like us aren't doing anything about it. Obama's blocked it repeatedly just as his predecessors did. They don't want it. And the pretext is, well, first we have to have a general peace settlement, and then we can do it. That means let's never do it. Uh, and the reason, which everyone understands, is we have to protect Israeli nuclear forces from inspection. And that's a very high uh, necessity, so therefore we have to sacrifice uh, the possibility, we have to accept the possibility that the whole nuclear proliferation system may collapse because it's so important to ensure that Israel dominates the region with nuclear weapons, client state. Well, those are things that are going on in the world. We don't have to accept them. Thank you very much. No, can we take, uh, it's 825 minutes. Yeah, I just look at it. One more. One more. Yeah. Uh, we're sorry, uh, Brett Chomsky will have to leave soon, so mm -hmm. I know you've been waiting for a long time, but just one more question. Oh. Sorry. Oh. Hello, Mr. Chomsky. Thank you for your... Oh. Hello, Mr. Chomsky. Thank, thank you for all your work throughout your lifetime. Uh, my mom, who's an elementary school teacher, is going back to school after many years to study linguistics, and I, being a high school teacher, I mean, I, being a high school student, uh, read a lot of your political work. Um, I took your recommendation uh, to read uh, Anarchism by Daniel Guerin. Right. Daniel Guerin. Yeah. Um, but to contrast, I read uh, 
Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman. Um, and there were actually some similarities. Uh, in the first chapter, uh, Milton Friedman says that uh, he advocates for absolute freedom, and that uh, reminded me of individual, individualist anarchists like Max Stirner. Uh, and he also said that uh, uh, there ought, that um, companies ought to be voluntary, work ought to be voluntary, and it ought to be cooperative, uh, which reminded me of you know, like anar anarcho-syndicalism. Uh, and the uh, free market sort of reminded me of uh, what anarchists called federalism. Um, so in brief, what really sets anarchism apart and makes it so virtuous, in your opinion, and what makes free market capitalism so uh, vicious? Well, there is a, a brand of what's called anarchism in the United States, and to an extent in England, yeah. which is a very sharp departure yeah. from the whole libertarian tradition. It's called anarcho-capitalism. -capital That's what's called libertarian here. Uh, if you take a look at it, it's advocacy of the most extreme form of autocracy and oppression that has ever existed. Uh, what it support, the policies, whatever the proponents may believe, the policies very quickly turn into concentration of power in the hands of unaccountable private institutions, the worst kind of autocracy uh, po political states are at least partially accountable. Private concentrations of power aren't. Uh, the idea that you have uh, f voluntary agreements, uh, that goes back to a famous comment of Anatole France, that under conditions of perfect freedom, uh, both the poor man and the rich man have equal rights to sleep under the bridge. Yeah, that's what voluntary agreement is if you're uh, if you have no means of support yeah. and somebody who has all the power is willing to give you a couple of pennies, you can make a voluntary agreement saying, okay, I won't starve, I'll be your slave. Yeah, voluntary agreement. Yeah. And in fact, some of the more honest advocates of this position, like James Buchanan, uh, Nobel Prize laureate, uh, argued at one point that every human being's highest aspiration is to ensure that everyone else in the world is his slave. That's the kind of people we are. That's our nature. We want to make sure that everyone is enslaved to us. And these policies basically are, are based on that conception of human nature. Another yeah. well-known advocate, Murray Rothbard, is strongly opposed to laws that require children to f parents to feed their children. Now why should parents be forced by the state to feed their children? Uh, that's the con and, and if you accept their conception of liberty, that's true. Why should you be? Uh, it's, it's radically different from the libertarian tradition, yeah. and it's pretty striking to see how different it is. Yeah. So if you go back to uh, back to say Adam Smith. Yeah who's supposed to be an uh, you know, advocate of classical liberalism. Yeah. Take a look at his actual views. Yeah. Uh, everyone's heard the phrase, invisible hand. Uh, very few people have bothered to look at how Adam Smith used the phrase. Actually, he used it twice. Once in Wealth of Nations, once in his, uh, his companion book, Moral Sentiments. In Moral Sentiments, here's the way he uses it. He says, suppose, it's an agricultural society he's talking about. He says, suppose some landowner accumulated almost all the land and everybody else had to depend on him for survival. He says, well, this wouldn't really matter very much because, because of the natural sympathy of the landowner for other people, which is kind of the core of human nature, he would make sure that the goods of the his possessions are distributed fairly equally. So it would end up with a fairly egalitarian society as if by an invisible hand. That's Adam Smith, not what you learned in school. Actually, the other place he uses it in Wealth of Nations, if you take a look, it's pretty much an argument against what's nowadays called uh, neoliberal globalization. 
that what he says is, uh, he says, suppose that in England, which is what he's concerned with, the uh, manufacturers and uh, merchants uh, sold their goods abroad, manufactured abroad, and imported from abroad. Uh, they'd make money, but the people of England will, would suffer. However, he says, probably not going to happen because they're going to have enough concern for their own society that they'll be willing to sacrifice profit for the general good. So as if by an invisible hand, we'll be saved from the ravages 